hello and welcome back. So today I want to analyze the way in which a circuit is built has an impact on circuit performance. So in particular what I want to look at is a basic amplifier circuit, so something that can be used as an audio amplifier, and look at the way in which the choice of components, whether it's through hole devices or surface mounted devices, and also the way in which the components are interconnected, has an impact on the circuit's performance, especially looking at how the assembly method has an impact on the circuit's immunity to external noise. So if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. So first, let's start off with a few words about the circuit that we will be analyzing today. So what I have here is a basic non-inverting amplifier built around an op amp. So the gain of this amplifier is set to 101, thanks to the two feedback resistors, so R2 and R3. And now this sort of gain is quite large, so a single stage amplifier with 101 gain is not that practical. So normally you would get this sort of gain from a two stage amplifier. but for today's experiment, I wanted to keep the circuit as simple as possible, so I ended up making a single stage with a very high gain. Now normally with an amplifier, your input will be connected to some sort of input signal. But for today's experiment, this input will be left floating. The reason being that I don't want to assess how well the amplifier amplifies a useful signal, but rather how well does it amplify a not so useful signal. So any sort of noise that's induced into the amplifier from the external environment will be picked up and amplified regardless of the presence or absence of an input signal. So today we will only be focusing on the noise that the amplifier picks up and then amplifies. Now it's important to observe that this amplifier has a gain bandwidth product of about 2 MHz. So with this sort of high gain your bandwidth will be limited to about 10-20 kHz. So any sort of noise that we want to inject into it needs to be below this threshold. Now over short distances noise can be induced into a circuit from magnetic or electric fields or even from various offsets occurring in the circuit over the traces. But what I want to focus on today is the induced magnetic fields. Since this is one of the major issues that can occur at low frequencies, having a source from local power transformers running at 50 or 60 Hz or even from switching converters. So the transformers and the switching converters can also generate noise that can be picked up by your audio amplifier, for example. But other than this, quite strong magnetic fields can also be generated by circuitry running at high currents. So the stronger the current running through the circuit, the stronger the magnetic field that it will generate. So the first assembly method to look at is the circuit built with through hole components and interconnected without a PCB. So direct interconnections in between the components, and this is an assembly method that was quite common before, well, PCBs were available, when components were fixed to large metallic frames to fixed solder points. So you can still see this sort of assembly method in old radios and TVs, and even though this is quite a time-consuming and manual labor-intensive method of assembling circuits, well, at the time there was nothing better. So people had to use it. But nowadays you will still see this sort of assembly method being used in things like audio amplifiers or other sort of circuits built for demonstrative purposes. So let's see how this sort of assembly method behaves. Now from an artistic point of view, this sort of circuit assembly can be made to look really really nice. So especially if you're using very large through hole components and you arrange them in a nice arrangement, it can be very pleasing to the eye. And you can make some very artsy looking circuits. So to test things out, I got my circuit here, it's connected to a 5 volt power supply and the output is connected through a coax cable to the input of the oscilloscope, so the first channel. And right now we have 10 millivolts per division and we can already see that there's the 50 hertz noise being induced into the circuit, so from the environment around it. But to perform our experiment, I have my inductor connected to the signal generator and I will be driving this with a 2 kHz sine wave to see how the sine wave gets induced into our circuit and then we can measure it with the oscilloscope. So let me just place my circuit close to the inductor and if I now 
turn on the signal generator, we can see that some noise appeared. So we can see that we have some high frequency noise going on. And based on how the circuit is placed around the inductor, more or less of this noise gets induced. Now to get a better reading of just how much noise gets induced, I will be turning to an FFT analysis. So we can see here our two kilohertz spike. If I quickly turn off the generator, we see it completely disappear. So this is not coming from the environment, but rather from our inductor. So I turn it back on again. And now based on how the circuit is placed around the inductor, we can see that the spike is larger or smaller. And the maximum value that we can obtain is about minus 39.5 decibels. So where my upper cursor is placed. And this gets obtained. Ah, we can get even more. So let's say about minus 39. But now let's look at why the circuit is not uniformly sensitive. So why some bits are more sensitive, some bits are less. So based on where the circuit is placed, we will get a stronger or weaker signal getting induced. Now to turn a magnetic field into a current and thus a problem in your circuit, you need an inductor. And now an inductor can be built out of a loop of wire. So a single turn inductor and passing a magnetic field through this will generate a current, but your inductor can also be formed by a circuit loop. So components disposed into a loop, this can be resistors, capacitors, diodes, whatever. And if you expose this to a time variable magnetic field, this will induce a current into the loop. Now the amount of current that you induce into the circuit will be dependent on multiple factors, most of which are schematic dependent, so there's not much you can do there. But one of them is layout dependent in the sense that it's very important what the surface area of the loop is. So a larger surface area will absorb more of the magnetic field and induce a stronger current. So the larger your circuit is, the more vulnerable it will be to external noise. So now if we turn back to our circuit and compare it to the schematic behind it, we can see that the actual construction of the circuit closely follows the schematic behind it. And we can also see that the circuit has some very large circuit loops. So the accent here was put on making the circuit look like the schematic rather than any other layout rule. Now, when we performed the measurement, we saw that parts of the circuit were a bit more sensitive. So especially this left side of the circuit, when it was put close to the inductor, created a stronger response than the right side. And well, the loops on the left side correspond to the input circuitry, and the loops on the right side correspond to the output and well, the decoupling and supply circuit. And the reason why the left side becomes so sensitive is that whatever noise gets induced into this part is well amplified by the amplifier. So the amplifier has a gain of 100. So most of the noise induced onto the input gets also amplified together with any useful signal. Noise induced into the right side of the amplifier will not get amplified. So it will be pushed into the output, but it will not be also amplified. So that's why the left side of the circuit is so much more sensitive than the right side. So this sort of circuit can be built to look really, really nice, but from a functional point of view, it's quite difficult to make something that can perform worse than this. So this sort of construction will usually have some very large circuit loops built into the way it's built. So it will be very sensitive to magnetic fields. At the same time, because there's quite a large distance between components, even things like decoupling capacitors will have very reduced effects. So in the end, this can be made to look really, really nice, but it won't perform that well. Now you can improve the performance of such a circuit by putting it into a metallic enclosure. So something to shield it from the exterior world, but that just defeats the purpose of making it look nice because well, nobody's going to see it. So the next best thing is to try to minimize the circuit loops. And the easiest way to do this is to turn to one of the most important developments in electronic circuit assembly technologies, the use of a printed circuit board. So my second circuit uses the exact same through hole components, but this time assembled onto a printed circuit board. 
So this is a single layer printed circuit board and you can go with multiple layer boards, but that's the subject of a different video. The purpose was to keep this and the previous circuit as comparable as possible so that the results can be more easily compared. So now if we quickly look at the layout of the board. So what I have here is the board. We have our supply connector on one side and the output on the other. And we can see that the components were not placed in any specific manner. So there's not a specific rule being applied here other than keeping the circuit as compact as possible. But anyway, we can already see that the size of the two circuits is completely different. So the PCB is far smaller and at the same time, all of the circuit loops are again much smaller. So let's see how will this impact the performance of the circuit. So now I switched the board. So I went for the second board, the one with through hole components on the PCB. We can see that we still see our 50 Hertz noise, but it's much smaller this time. And now if we turn on the signal generator, well, depending on how the board is placed, we still get some induced noise, but it's slightly smaller. So now let's turn to the FFT analysis to get a more accurate measurement of just how much noise is being induced. So again, I have it set to be centered around the two kilohertz spike. We see our upper cursor where our initial measurement was, so the first circuit. And now based on where the circuit is placed, so now position is no longer that important since, well, the whole board fits inside of the inductor. But we can see that our spike, no matter where the board is placed, is roughly six decibels lower than our initial measurement. So making the circuit smaller made it a bit more resilient to the induced magnetic fields. So things are better, but it's not perfect yet. So what can be done to further improve this? Now, the usage of a printed circuit board offers multiple benefits. So on the one side, circuit size starts to decrease. You can have much larger density of components, but also the circuit is far more mechanically robust. And since we're no longer focused on the artistic looks of the circuit, well, component placement can be done according to some technical rules. So we no longer care how the circuit looks, but rather we can put the components in their optimum position. And in general, the circuit will be easier to assemble and it will be far more resilient in time. So what can be better than this? Well, we can further reduce circuit size and at the same time the loops in the circuit by going with smaller components. And to that end, we can go to the next major development in electronic circuit assembly technologies. And that is the transition from through hole components to surface mounted components. Now these come in all shapes and sizes, but usually you will be able to find the equivalent surface mounted device to a through hole device in a much smaller package. And as long as the circuit doesn't have to dissipate large amounts of power, you can build the exact same circuit with surface mounted components in a much smaller size, so with much smaller circuit loops. So again, I assemble the exact same circuit on a printed circuit board, and even though the outer edges are the same as before, the space occupied by the circuit itself is much smaller. So all of the circuit loops are again much smaller. So now here we see the layout for this board. We can see that other than a single trace, everything fit on a single layer. So this was the only trace that, well, ended up being a problem. Now if I remove all of the text, we can also see the layout a bit better. And we can see that because of the very small components, the circuit loops also end up being much, much smaller than before. So again, no special layout rules were applied other than trying to keep the circuit compact. So now let's see what sort of effect this had on circuit performance. So now what I have here is the final board connected to the same setup. And even without turning on the signal generator, we can already see that the noise is slightly smaller. So there's less high frequency noise in there. So the board is picking up less noise from the environment. Now, if I run the signal generator, we see that there's a bit more fuzziness appearing. So it's far less than before. But again, to get a good measurement, let's turn to the FFT analysis. So here we see again our two kilohertz spike and my upper cursor is set to the level at which the previous measurement was. So the PCB board built with through hole components. And now if we move around this board outside of the inductor, we see that our central spike 
only goes to a level about 11 decibels lower than our previous measurement. So regardless of where it's placed around the inductor, we can't really get above this level. So if we compare this measurement to our very first measurement, the one with the components placed in the air, we're about 17 to 18 decibels lower. So the exact way in which the components are placed, how close they are together, has a clear impact on just how much noise you can induce into the circuit. Now, the last step that we could try is go for an integrated solution. So rather than to have a bunch of discrete interconnected components, go for a single IC that has everything built into it. Now, of course, this isn't always a possibility. You don't always have an integrated solution for exactly what you want. But when you do have this solution, well, normally it will perform better. So it's quite a good idea to go for integrated components rather than to building large discrete circuitry, since the integrated circuit will be far more immune to external noise. So in the end, creating a good circuit layout is quite a complex thing. But a fundamental rule that should be applied to achieve good circuit performance is to keep the loops in the circuit as small as possible. Now, when specifically talking about an amplifier, so a signal amplifier, the loops present at the beginning of the circuit, so before the amplification chain, need to be prioritized over the loops at the end of the amplification chain. Since any noise induced at the beginning will be also amplified by your amplifier. And one fundamental way that this can be achieved is the use of small components assembled on a printed circuit board. This will allow the most compact assembly possible. And with that said, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my videos and see you next time. Bye bye.